Hi, and welcome to Bridgepoint Church Online. My name is Ashley Sears, and I'm the Women's Director, but today I get to be your online host. I'd like to direct you to some of the resources in the description below. There are links for our online Facebook community called Bridgepoint Home. You can also download our sermon notes there. Check out the resources we've got. I also want to invite you to stick around after the service for some really great announcements.
my soul devotion my only focus to worship you my life surrendered my heart Hey, welcome everybody. We are really glad that you are joining us here for our online service. And I just want you to know that uh, Becky and I appreciate so much uh, all the kind words and the cards and uh, your generosity 
in celebrating our 40th anniversary here at Bridgepoint. Uh, I'll tell you that we cannot think of any other place we would rather be, and we are so thankful for everything that uh, you've done. And, uh, you know, I know that <clears throat> we had some technical difficulties with our online service last week. Uh, we've identified what the issues were, and, uh, you know, Jeff Poole has done a really great job and worked really hard. Uh, those services are back up online. If you didn't catch it, you can always watch it now. And so uh, we are uh, anticipating that uh, no issues, no problems. And uh, here's what we talked about last week. Last week, we asked this question, is the church essential? Now, I, I mean, that's a question that's still being asked, and there are states that are, that are really wrestling with this and are declaring that church is not essential and closing the doors and all uh, different things. Now, we answered the question last week, is the church essential by defining who the church is for? And the church is for God. Now, there's no question that, uh, you know, whether you are a believer or maybe an unbeliever, hey, we all benefit from the church and and in fact, the community that churches are located in, man, if we're not making a difference in the community, our neighborhood, then we're really not doing what God has called us to do. But, uh, you know, we, we learned that because the church is for God, that what we are supposed to do in, in the church is that we are to bring glory to God and to lift up his name. Now, today, the question is, how? Uh, how do we bring glory uh, to God? What are we supposed to do? So uh, we're going to start out by looking at our roots. And so if you have a Bible there with you, look to Acts chapter number two. And while you are turning there, we're going to talk about the first church in Acts chapter number two. And while you're getting there, I want to give you just a little background. In Acts chapter number two, it is the day of Pentecost which means it's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus has already ascended into heaven, and his disciples have been instructed to just wait, and they have been gathered in one place. And the Bible talks about that there was uh, an amazing unity with the people that were there. And what Jesus had promised before his crucifixion, he had promised a comforter. He had promised that he was going to send someone, and he does. In the beginning part of Acts chapter number 2, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And what Jesus had talked about with these disciples before his crucifixion, I mean, it happens. The church is born on the day of Pentecost, and there are 120 disciples who receive the Holy Spirit, and they are empowered to go out into the world. And this event is incredible. There is a sound like a rushing, mighty wind. And so it's not just this little gentle summer breeze, right? I mean, there is fire that appears. And as a result of them receiving the Holy Spirit, there is at least 15 different languages that are spoken. And in the middle of all of this, there's a crowd that gathers. I mean, they are, they're wondering, what's going on here? You know, I think these people have had way too much to drink. But out of curiosity, this huge crowd gathers. And what happens is that Peter preaches a very pointed gospel message. And in the very first few hours of the church, we're going to dive into the story and we're going to find out, look, what are we supposed to do? What is our purpose as a church in order to bring God glory? Now, here is the first purpose of the church. It is evangelism and outreach and missions. And you know what? If you've been around church for a while, these are familiar words. These are church words, right? And so uh, it's, it's what is happening. It's telling the story of what Jesus has done for us. It's the very first thing that's done. It's, it's the message of the gospel. It's the greatest need of humanity. The message of repentance that Peter preaches 
He preaches it with such boldness and such conviction that uh, there are people in this audience that are crying out, what should we do? And Peter responds, and he says, you need to repent. And after you repent, you need to be baptized. You need to show a, a public identification that you have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Let's dive into the middle of this story in verse number 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. This is such a great verse because, you know, those who gladly received his word. I, I mean, they were so excited <clears throat> to be able to have their sins forgiven, to be able to hear the message of the gospel. And as a result, you know, they were, they were willing to take a public stand for Jesus Christ. They were willing to identify with Jesus Christ by showing his death, burial, and resurrection and baptism. And on that very first day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. So, you talk about explosive church growth, you go from about 120 to right around 3,120 on the very first day. Look, this is incredible. They are living, this audience is living in a culture that, uh, you know, it's not a godly culture. The taxes are sky high. There is Roman occupation. Uh, Jesus' crucifixion is not the first crucifixion that happened in Jerusalem. This had happened a lot. And they are uh, under corrupt religious leaders. So, so what the gospel does, what evangelism does, what outreach does, what missions does, it does this. The gospel deals hope. That's what the gospel does. It, it deals hope throughout history. In every location, there's always this great need for hope. There is a desperation that people experience. And I mean, look around. You think our world needs hope now? Are we living in a nation that needs hope? When you think about uh, the, the COVID-19 virus, you think about what has happened to the economy, the division in this country, and the anger that people have. Wow, are we in need of hope? Absolutely. And where are you going to find hope from? Can you find hope from politicians, athletes, the entertainment industry? Can you find hope in things that uh, lead to addictions? Nah. Nah. You know what gives hope? The gospel deals hope. The gospel gives hope. It's, it's the love that's found in the gospel. It's the forgiveness. It's the removal of guilt. It's knowing that your sins are forgiven. You know you're going to heaven as a result of the gospel. That's why the gospel is full of hope. So, someone said this, hope. It goes into the darkest places and cracks open a thin wedge of light that eventually floods the room. If you think about what happened on this particular day, well, it was a dark place. And there was a thin wedge of light, the message of the gospel. And what happens just in a few short years, well, the message of the gospel floods, not the room, it floods the earth. Wow. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3 puts it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so the words that are found here, abundant mercy and living hope and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, these are all words that, that deal hope. You know, the fact that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead 
means that we have the hope of doing that too. Look at the very next verse, verse number four. It says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Well, these words, incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Wow, these are words of hope. These are words of faith. These are words of reality. You know, uh, many of you, you know Rob and Debbie Steen. And Debbie has uh, been suffering from cancer for a while. Becky and I were able to go out uh, just this week and pray for her and pray for Rob. But she passed away. And I'm talking to Rob. You know, it's not a, there's sorrow because you absolutely miss and love that person. But there's hope that's in that sorrow because death is not a final goodbye. Death is just a temporary farewell. The gospel deals hope. If you want to know what the purpose of the church is and how the church brings glory to God, then the purpose of the church, first and foremost, has to be the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another purpose, and that is uh, purpose number two. Oh, it's discipleship and maturity. Hey, again, some church words, but they're good words. It's, it's a process of us growing. Now, in this very same section of Scripture, look at verse number 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And so this group of believers, you know, they were under consistent biblical teaching, and they are just like brand new believers. And so the Bible talks about this. The Bible talks about that, that there are things in God's word that are just like milk. And as newborn babies, right? I mean, you don't give a newborn baby T-bone steak, right? Uh, you're giving them milk, and that's what they need in order to grow. But as you grow and you mature, then there is teaching that is described as meat. And we're growing and we're learning things. And, and uh, you know, we may start out like in elementary school in our, in our walk with the Lord, but I'll tell you, he'll take us to graduate school because there are some lessons that we will learn uh, in our discipleship and maturity process. But, but here's what I'm really talking about. It's this. The Bible delivers meaning. That's what the Bible does. I mean, where are you going to go to answer the big questions of life that every single person has? Questions like this. Who am I? I mean, who, who am I? And, and what am I doing here? What, what's my purpose? What am I supposed to accomplish? And then, where am I going? And what's going to happen when I die? I mean, you can look for those kind of answers in a lot of different places, and there are many places available. <clears throat> in fact, there is just so much information and so many things available. Look at this quote. Never in the history of the world has so much useful and useless information been available to so many so quickly. And there's a lot of information out there, just a few clicks away, that will give answers. But those answers are not all true. It is the scripture. The Bible is the true foundation. It's the, the, the word of God that doesn't change. It, it stands the test of time. It's what we can build our life on. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 12 puts it this way. It says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, 
for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, look, we're supposed to learn things. We're supposed to, to grow. And then the next verse says this, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, or in other words, a, a mature person, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so there's this, there's this growing faith, and it produces uh, unity and maturity. And the more that we, that we know about God, the more that we learn about God, then the more that we love him, and then the more that we give him glory. What's the purpose of the church? Absolutely, discipleship, maturity, of course. But there's another purpose of the church, and that is uh, fellowship and relationships. And I don't know about you, but when I grew up, when I grew up anything that uh, had the word fellowship to it meant that there was a potluck and something was, something was going on, right? In the very first days of this first church, they were doing life together. They weren't out there by themselves or all alone. Verse number 44 in Acts chapter number 2. Now all who believed were together, and they had all things in common. And verse 46, it says this, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Wow, this, this consistent uh, gathering together, this uh, unity, this care, care and compassion, this acknowledgement of, of the needs that people have, even to the point of being willing to sell stuff to meet those needs, it happens as a result of gathering in larger groups in the temple and in the smaller gatherings at home. And what it produces, it produces gladness. And instead of confusion and complexity, it produces simplicity of heart. You know what fellowship and relationship means in our world today? It means this, that other Christians fill relational voids. And look, every single one of us, we've got a few relational voids, right? We were never meant to be alone. And uh, when we are alone, it accelerates, you know, not the best part of us, but oftentimes the, the worst part of us. And you think about the time and place that we live in now. I mean, technology, uh, does, it, does technology help people become closer together or, or does it add distance? I, I guess in some ways it, it brings people closer together. You know, maybe uh, you serve in uh, the Air Force and you're deployed and now you can, you know, have a video call and you can see. And so that technology is, is awesome to be able to do that. But, but, but so many times that's not what happens. Now here's a quote that talks about this. We have never been more connected as a culture before, right? And we've never felt more disconnected. What happens is that uh, things like social media that are supposed to, you know, help keep us connected and those kind of things. Well, you know, I, I guess they can. But if we're not careful, <clears throat> then our connectivity will just be online instead of in person. And when you add COVID-19 to all the things that, that, that are happening over the last several months, I mean, you remember, I mean, it was March and April and May. There was forced isolation. You weren't supposed to get out. If you drove, streets were empty, you know. You, you were only supposed to go to things that were, you know, deemed essential. It wasn't church at the time, but it was, you know, groceries and those type of things. And hardly anybody was in there. Remember that we couldn't find toilet paper at all? Wow. When a person is asked, who do you work through your life problems with or, or the issues that you have? Who do you have that you work through? 
The number one answer to that question is this, no one. And what we find ourselves is that we find ourselves with a lot of connection and a lot of technology and we're more disconnected than we have ever been. John chapter 13, verse number 35 says this, that your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And so it is hard to love someone that you don't know. It is, uh, it is hard when, when days go by and they turn into weeks and those turn into months and you, you sit there and you say to yourself, well, I, I don't have any friends. I, I don't have any, I may have some acquaintances, right? But I really don't have anybody that I can share these deep things with. And when I really need help, who am I going to call? You know, what this verse tells us is that when we as believers love one another, not from an arm's length, but from an up close and personal relationship, that the world knows that you're my disciples and that brings glory to God. To, for, for people who don't know God to be able to recognize God as a result of us actually loving one another brings him glory. Here, here's a good question that we might consider. It's this, what are you doing to forge the deepest relationships you can forge in this life? And if your answer is like nothing, then you're never gonna have deep relationships because deep relationships don't just happen on their own. They take a lot of intentionality. <clears throat> they take a lot of pursuit. They take a lot of work. But the, but the re result is so awesome to have a deep relationship with, with someone or a, a group of people that you can do life together. And some people find that in, in small groups. I got to tell you, I, I, I meet with a group of guys on Thursday morning and on Tuesday morning, and we have forged some deep relationships because we've been consistent in meeting together and we have been frankly transparent about stuff that's going on and we have prayed together. And there have been times that we have rejoiced together and there are times that we have sorrowed together. But there's some deep relationships formed because there was a willingness for this particular case, you know, every Tuesday, and every Thursday, six o'clock in the morning, boy, that's intentional because you're not going to just stagger uh, into church at 6 a.m. by accident. Now, you may not be able to build relationships with everyone. Of course not. And uh, you can't build relationships from a distance, but there is someone or a group of people that you can build relationships, but you have to be willing to forge those deep relationships Proverbs says this, it says a, 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 per, a man or a person who uh, is going to have friends must show themselves friendly. And that's this fellowship and relationship and how other Christians fill our relational void. Now, here's number four. It's uh, ministry and serving. This is what relationships lead to. It's, it's when you love one another and you are meeting those needs. Let's go back to Acts chapter number two. Remember, now all who believed were together and they had all things in common. And the next verse says this, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Uh, this is no longer about me. It, it's, it's using what God has blessed me with to be a blessing to others. This is a, a generous spirit that brings joy and it's seeing a bigger picture. And you know what? There's an awareness of this. In order to meet a need, you have to know that there's a need. And in order to know that there's a need, you got to be close enough to see it. And they were willing to, to, to do whatever they needed to do to make sure that everyone was taken care of. How can I be a blessing? When you're thinking about ministry 
and serving, here's what is really important about that. Selflessness fights against our drift to entitlement. Because we all have this drift. You know, um, if, if you and I are not careful, we will be in plenty entitled. We'll think about, oh, well, you know, this is what I am owed. And, and uh, when it comes to entitlement, you absolutely can see it in others. You go, oh, yeah, yeah, he is entitled. Or you see it in groups. Oh, yeah, that group. Well, they are entitled. But, uh, you know, if we're not careful, well, we'll all listen to the same radio station. And this radio station is WIFM. And it stands for What's In It For Me. We can do it when it comes to church. We talked about that last week. What's in it for me? No, that's not the point of it. Well, you know, it's for God. And when we live our lives where, where we're going to go, okay, I'm going to do the opposite of this. I, I'm not going to live what's in it for me. I, I'm going to live, hey, what, what can I do to please God? What can I do to help others? Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20 talks about this. It says, my old self, this is, you know, before uh, I became a Christian, and this is this old flesh, even now that I continue with, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live this earthly body, in this earthly body, by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer about me. I'm, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm living with Christ, living through me. And, and, and today, at whatever time I have, I'm, I'm going to trust in God because I know he loves me. And he sacrificed for me. And it brings God glory when we as individuals and us as a church, we live a life of service. We live a life where we are looking out for the needs of other people. Jesus himself said, he answered the question, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? And he said that the greatest in the kingdom of God is the greatest servant. And this, this is so countercultural. This is so unexpected that when you see it, it just stands out. And so when you're talking about ministry, and serving, well, here's really what you're talking about. You're talking about a life <clears throat> defined by generosity and service to others, especially those in need. You know, especially for those, you know, you're doing something for that they can't really do anything back for you. It's not about what you're getting out of the deal. It's what you're giving. So it's a life defined by generosity and service to others, especially those in need. It's increasingly attractive to a world that is suffocating on itself. Wow. The consumerism, the materialism, all this stuff that people want to pursue, uh, you'll choke on it eventually. Wow. Now this brings us to the last reason, purpose for today. And that is... <clears throat> Worship and gratitude. When we gather together, we, and we, we went over this last week, you know, when we gather together, who's church for? Church is for God, and we're going to spend time thanking God for who he is and what he uh, has done for us. And it says that very same thing in verse number 47, praising God. That's what they're doing when they're gathered together. And whether it's, uh, you know, in the larger group in the temple or it's a smaller group, from house to house, this is what they're doing. They're praising God. And as a result of all these things that they're doing, they're having favor with all the people. Wow, not just those who are believers, but everybody that they're coming in contact with. They're having favor. Uh, they have a good reputation in the community. And as a result, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God works Lives are changed. It's a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the greatest miracle that ever happens, it, you know, it, it's not uh, the money that you may uh, have been provided with. It, it's, it's not, 
you know, if, if you get that new job, I mean, all that stuff is great. But the greatest miracle is when someone receives the gospel. The greatest miracle is when someone goes from life, uh, from death into life. The greatest miracle is when somebody is lost and now they are found. We, we worship, we're grateful. In Revelation chapter number four, verse number 11, this is a scene in heaven, in the future, and here's what they're doing. They're declaring that you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. So what is happening? Well, we are bringing glory to God. So what does that translate to? Well, it translates to this. Hey, make the mission the mission. Uh, what's the mission to give glory to God? And make that mission what you're going to do. Make the mission the mission. We, uh, we bring God glory by fulfilling his purposes. We, we bring God glory by dealing in the hope of the gospel. We bring God glory by delivering meaning to life through strong teaching and preaching of the principles and practical application of the Bible. We fill relational voids that we have with other believers and we serve together to fight entitlement and we worship the Lord in a spirit of humbleness and gratitude, giving him the glory. Now, what do we do with this? <clears throat> What's our action points? And if you have some sermon notes with you or you downloaded them, then here, here's just some things to uh, uh, do a self-assessment or maybe even better yet, let the Holy Spirit do an assessment. Here's a question. How, am I, how involved am I and those I lead in helping to accomplish God's purpose? What is it that I'm doing? Uh, how am I using my gifts, talents, and experiences? And what about those who... Uh, I'm leading. Maybe it's in my family. Maybe it's somebody that you have influence over. How are you helping them to accomplish God's purpose? Here's the second thing. Where am I using my gifts, talents, and experiences to help others? You know those things that God has blessed you with? It may not necessarily be financial resources. Uh, one of the greatest gifts that you can give to anybody is your time or your full attention. Where am I using my gifts, talents, and experiences? And then here's the last one. When do I intentionally gather with other believers? In large gatherings? I, I, I know right now we're kind of in this weird time where many of you, you know, we're, we're meeting online and I'm thankful that we're able to do that. But there's coming a day when we're going to be done with all of this. And my hope is that we will be able to gather back all together and be intentionally, intentional about uh, worshiping the Lord together. So when you think about how do we give glory to God, well, we give glory to God by doing the same thing that this first church did. And when we do that, it would be amazing what God will do. He will add to the church daily those who are being saved. Let's pray together. God, we uh, come to you today and we're thankful to be encouraged and challenged by what your word has to say. And, and here's this little baby church and yet they're doing exactly what they should be doing. And as a result, uh, it, it just, this church explodes. And <clears throat> the impact that they have is, uh, well, we feel it to this very day. So Lord, I, I pray for our church and I, I would pray for other churches as well, that what we would do is that we would uh, fulfill the purposes that you have called us to fulfill, and that is then to ultimately bring you honor and glory. So Lord, help us as individuals and help us as a church, Lord. We're thankful that you love us, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, next week, we're going to continue with this uh, sermon series called The Gathering, and, and we're going to be a more specific about, hey, what is my part? What, where do I fit in? What am I supposed to do uh, as part of the church? So, uh, this next week, may God bless you. May God give you the grace that you need. May God give you the wisdom that you need. And may we, as individuals and a church, 
bring glory to God. God bless. If you're a local family of elementary age kids and you want some in-person connection, we'd love to invite you to a picnic in the park. Join us next Sunday, September 27th from 1 to 3 p.m. right here in Boise at Ivy Wild Park. For more information, contact Kendra. If you're new to Bridgepoint and you have questions about our mission, vision, and values, Discover Bridgepoint is the best place to get those questions answered. Join us on October 1st at 7 p.m. online for Discover Bridgepoint. You can sign up on the Church Center app or click the link in the description below. We say every week how generous the people of Bridgepoint Church are. That does not just impact us locally, but it impacts all over the world. If you would like to read some amazing stories about what's happening, please join our Bridgepoint Global Facebook page. The link is in the description below. If you'd like to partner with Bridgepoint Church, you can do so one of three ways. The first way is through your Church Center app. Just simply hit the Give tab. The second way is you can text the word GIVE to 208-826-4433. Or you can simply pop a check in the mail to the address on your screen. However you choose to do that, thank you for your generosity. Well, it's been an incredible day so far. Don't forget to join us next week at the same time as we wrap up our series called Gathering. Have a great week.